about copper. And no story about the red metal would be complete without relating a little of the history of western Montana and its largest city, Butte. Mining first started here in 1862, when into the surrounding hills men came flocking by the thousands from the fast depleting placer workings in California. Besides, it wasn't copper, but gold, and then silver, that lured those hardy pioneers into an unnamed and untamed territory. Placer gold mining in western Montana continued for only a short time before the gravels were exhausted. Then the discovery of rich silver lodes held the miners' interest in Once a prospector's tent site, Butte now has a population of 40,000 and holds its own with the country's finest in transportation, residential and business areas, shopping districts, and the recreation, arts, and sciences make for modern living. Among the many prospectors who tramped the soil on which Butte now stands was Mike Hickey. It was he who first laid claim to the Anaconda mine in 1876. It held high promise as a silver producer, but as time went on, Mike realized that profitable deep hole mining, with all the labor, materials, and equipment it entailed, called for a great deal more than shoestring methods of finance. So, after four years, he sold the mine to Marcus Daly, an experienced hard rock miner backed with the resources necessary for development. These scenes show some of Butte's surface workings as they now appear, more than 60 years after Daly, with a main shaft down to 340 feet, uncovered evidence of the great body of copper ore in the Anaconda. Yet that day in 1882 marked a transition for Butte. Copper was to become its principal metal. Daly may have visualized it as the richest hill on earth, a title Butte Hill earned for itself in later years. But even in his wildest flights of fancy, he couldn't have foreseen that the hill on which he stood would one day be honeycombed with more than 2,000 miles of underground openings, or that his modest diggings would become one of the district's 15 main shafts, some of them extending nearly a mile below the surface. As a tribute to Daly's pioneering of Montana's copper industry, this memorial stands at the entrance of the Montana School of Mines, the seat of learning for Montana's mining metallurgical and geological engineers. Here, with up-to-date laboratories and in close proximity to actual operations, the engineer is offered a real opportunity for study, research, and practice in his chosen field. And now to get down to the business of mining, smelting, and refining copper. Let's start as the miners do, at the collar of a shaft. A shift is ready to go underground. Hard-toed shoes and safety hats mounted with electric battery lamps are part of the equipment specially designed for their protection. Head frames tower above all main shafts, in some instances rising to the height of a 10-story building. They must be strong enough to hoist three and four deck cages of men, materials, and supplies, and the skips which carry up to seven tons of ore per trip. Miles of steel cable, almost two inches in diameter, run over the shiv wheels at the top of the head frame, over idler towers, and into the hoist house. No ordinary job is that of the hoisting engineer. Cages and skips travel fast and safely, and in some instances, four times as deep as the Empire State Building is high. Dials on these electric hoists indicate the position of the cage at all times, and to a fraction of a foot. A reading of the dials and drum tells us that the cage has arrived at the 3,200 foot level. Here they are. The trip has taken only four minutes, and the men are heading for the underground lockers to pick up the tools, 
equipment and supplies they'll need. On their way to the working face, the miners travel along cross cuts or drifts with safety zones spaced at frequent intervals and indicated with light reflecting markers. In this cross cut, the rock stands up well without the supporting timbers so necessary in other sections of the 1500 miles of travelways such as this, which have been driven under Butte Hill. The first operation is to set up a jumbo. This is a conveniently movable staging on which two or more air drills are mounted. Detachable bits save 80% of the weight of drill steel hauled to the surface for sharpening. Water is forced through the hollow drill, speeding up the cutting action and eliminating dust. Much care and study are given to the pattern of the round and the depth of the holes so that the maximum advance will be obtained. The 18 holes drilled in this face are now loaded with explosives, but they won't be fired all at once. To break the round most efficiently, the holes are fired in a prescribed order by fuses cut to predetermined lengths. After all the fuses have been lighted from a single fuse spitter, the bunches are broken apart so that one hole on exploding won't pull the fuse from another. This is a job for skilled hands and cool heads, which this father and son have in abundance, for they've been working together as an underground team for more than 10 years. Now come the blasts in rapid succession, followed by several dull booms, which are lifters, exploding unseen under the 50-ton ore pile and shattering the rock still further for easy handling. After the ventilating system has cleared the atmosphere of smoke and gas, the first job is to bar down all loose rock, both overhead and from the side walls. A mechanical loader is brought in. Slide rails are moved ahead as the loader advances. When the area is cleared, permanent rails will be installed. To move this 50-ton ore pile would be a sizable and tedious hand job, but this pneumatically driven loader will do it in about four hours. Before further advance is made, the blasted area must be timbered, so underground timber stations supply a dozen different types of prefabricated forms. Here on the face that we've just seen blasted, posts, caps, and girts are in place, secured with blocks and wedges. The set is then covered with lagging, and soon the drills will be set up again. Most ore production comes from stopes. These are the excavations on the vein above the drift. This is a timbered square set slot stope. Working faces are sampled regularly to provide controls for breaking. And here is another method of stoping, used where timbering is not necessary. This is called the horizontal cut and fill stope. The notes the geologist is taking of the structure will provide information for correlating the veins and guiding the development. In these close quarters, drag line scrapers pull the ore to a raise, which is a connection between the level above and the one below. The ore drops down a chute, through a safety gate, and into a mine car. Regardless of where the ore originates, it eventually finds its way into mine cars headed for the nearest shaft. Here, two haulage drifts converge. The six-ton electric battery locomotive is hauling a ten-car train, each car holding three tons of ore. The distance to the shaft varies from a few hundred feet to half a mile. Arriving at the station, each car dumps automatically as it passes over the skip pocket. 
the ore drops through a grizzly, which screens out oversized material and lands in a pocket at the shaft. A measured amount of ore then runs through air-operated gates into the skip. And here, a seven-ton skip load of ore is ready for its trip to the surface. Arriving at the head frame, the skip is tilted automatically and the ore drops into a receiving bin on the surface. Hoisting skips are run in counterbalance in the same shaft. While a loaded skip is coming up, an empty one is going down. Now a Larry car transfers the ore from the receiving bin to the railroad loading bins. Then 55 ton standard railroad cars are quickly loaded from chutes, which are also controlled by air gates and made up into 125 car ore trains hauled by powerful electric locomotives. While the ore train is making its run to the reduction works at Anaconda, we'll look around a bit here at Butte and see what other activities enter the job of mining ore. Disposal of mine water is a big operation in the Butte mines. Every day, seven million gallons must be pumped to the surface. Mine water contains considerable copper in solution, which is reclaimed in surface plants. This is one of a series of underground stations in which electrically driven centrifugal pumps raise water to the surface by thousand foot intervals. These are air compressors and this plant can compress 220 million cubic feet of free air every day. Delivered through underground pipelines, it supplies the large quantities of compressed air needed to operate rock drills mechanical loaders, scrapers, timber hoists, and similar air-operated equipment. The compressed air is stored in receiver tanks and is delivered to various pipelines at required pressures. We already talked about underground ventilation and air conditioning. Well, here is one of 18 surface fans, which exhaust two and a half million cubic feet of air each minute. In the deeper workings, the higher temperatures encountered are moderated by this cooling system. Heat is absorbed in brine, which is pumped to cooling towers on the surface. The cooled brine is returned to the air conditioning plants underground. Each day, the heat removed by this equipment could melt 3,000 tons of ice. As this stockpile of caps indicates, mining operations also depend heavily on timber. The company's 465,000 acres of timber holdings are located in western Montana in the area between the Continental Divide and the Idaho State Line. These timberlands, dotted by beautiful mountain lakes, consist chiefly of ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, and western larch although spruce, lodgepole pine, and hemlock are also found in some districts. Here, where the old-style crosscut has given way to the new type power saw, the timber is made ready for its trip to the mill. Winter or summer, sturdy tractors haul out the logs to loading stations. Loaded onto trucks by booms, they are carried over roads which giant bulldozers carved out of the forest. Thence to railroad flat cars for the journey down the canyon to the mills at Bonner or Rocker. The load is tripped and the logs spill into the mill pond. Expert rivermen fork the logs to the bull chain, which lifts them into the mill for processing. Most of the bark is removed by high-speed jets of water. Mine timbers must be so processed that they will fit a wide variety of conditions, and that means specialized machinery. This machine is trimming caps. Then comes slabbing, which is squaring up the sides. 
And here's an ingenious multiple operation which frames the square set caps we've already seen. A small part of the millions of board feet needed each year for the mines. This mill at Bonner, Montana, is equipped with remanufacturing facilities, such as double-cutting band mills. It not only provides lumber for mine and smelter, but also produces large quantities for commercial use. 26 miles northwest of Butte is the city of Anaconda, site of the Anaconda Reduction Works and destination of the copper ore train we saw leaving Butte. Anaconda, county seat of Deer Lodge County, was designed in the 80s and is well equipped for the job it has to do and for the comfort, convenience, and recreation of its citizens, the majority of whom are associated with the company's activities. The reason why the smelter is located 25 miles from the mines and over mountainous terrain at that, can be given in one word, water. 45 million gallons of it for every 24 hours the plants are in operation. Georgetown Lake, with its 25-mile shoreline, is a storage reservoir for emergency use. Silver Lake, where the water temperature seldom rises over 42 degrees, even during the summer months, is the principal source of supply. From Myers Dam, seven miles west of the city, the water is delivered through a seven-mile underground pipeline, which not only serves the reduction works, but the city of Anaconda as well. This is the Anaconda Reduction Works, one of the largest copper smelters in the world. Here are processed copper ores, zinc ores, manganese ores and phosphate rock. The copper ore, which contains about 4% copper, will go through a series of concentrating and reduction operations, which will result in anodes containing 99.3% copper, plus the gold and silver present in the original ore. But here comes that 125 car ore train from Butte. Smaller trains of 27 cars each will be made up in the yards for the long, winding, seven and a half mile trip to the top of the plant. On arrival, no time is lost in starting the ore on its long journey. With the aid of this rotary car dumper, 1,200 tons an hour are dropped into the hoppers. The ore on this conveyor belt is headed for the crushing plant. Fine material will pass through grizzlies or screens, while the coarse ore will drop into the bowl-shaped mouth of the gyratory crusher. This is a massive piece of equipment housed in a three-story building. To prepare the ore for flotation, it must be further reduced in size. So this conveyor is headed for more crushing rolls and screens. And finally, to these ball mills. With cast iron balls and water added, the revolving mills grind up the ore to the size of fine sand, then discharge it into the classifier, where the coarser particles are returned to the mill by a screw conveyor. No ore can escape this circuit until it is ground fine enough to free the valuable mineral particles from the worthless rock so that they can be separated by flotation. In the flotation process, the finely ground ore mixed with water and certain oils and organic compounds is aerated, forming a froth. The sulfide mineral particles cling to the surface while the worthless rock sinks to the bottom of the cells. The overflow, or froth, is too wet to be handled in the roasting furnace. So after partial dewatering in settling tanks, the water content of this heavy, mud-like sulfide mass is further reduced in these filters. 
A partial vacuum inside the canvas-covered discs draws the water out of the cake. The concentrate now contains about 25% copper and is ready for the next operation, roasting. In the multiple hearth roasting furnaces, a large part of the sulfur content will be oxidized. Concentrate is dropped on the top hearth and as it descends from floor to floor, it first becomes dry, then as the heat increases, the sulfur begins to burn and the roasting operation becomes self-sustaining. Temperatures reach 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, so the rabble arms which spread and mix the concentrate must be water-cooled. The product of the roaster is called calcine. It drops into hoppers at the bottom of the furnace and, still hot, is loaded into tram cars for transfer to the reverberatory furnace building. Reverberatory furnaces are huge, gas-fired, brick-lined structures taking several hundred tons at a charge and permitting a continuous smelting operation. The hot calcine is dropped at intervals into the furnace from the charge floor above. Fluxes are added, and so is some of the converter slag. At a temperature of about 2600 degrees Fahrenheit, the charge melts and separates by gravity. The copper sulfide and iron sulfide form a mixture called matte, which sinks to the bottom of the furnace and is tapped periodically. This molten mat, containing from 45 to 50 percent copper, is transferred in ladles to the converters. The function of these giant converters, which hold 120 tons to the charge, is to remove the iron and sulfur from the mat, leaving metallic copper. This is accomplished by blowing air, under pressure, through the molten mass. Sulfur gases pass into the flue, while the iron oxide combines with silica to form a slag. Converter slag has a recoverable copper value and is returned to the reverberatory for retreatment. The product resulting from the final converter operation is blister copper, approximately 99% pure, but not yet pure enough to be used commercially. Most of the remaining impurities are removed by a further blowing operation here in the casting room. The copper is now ready for casting 425 pound anodes, which will be used for the production of electrolytic copper. Because copper solidifies so rapidly, it is run into a pouring spoon, which holds just enough to fill one mold. By the time the casting wheel has made half a turn, the cast anodes can be lifted and quenched, and the molds prepared to repeat the cycle. While the anodes are being packed in boxcars for shipment to the electrolytic refinery at Great Falls, we'll take a look at some of the other operations performed here at Anaconda. This 270-foot rotary kiln was designed for processing manganese concentrates derived from the rhodochrosite ores of Butte's mines. On entering the kiln, the concentrates are first dried. As they approach the gas burners in the lower end, they release carbon dioxide. As the sintering zone is entered, with a temperature of 2600 degrees Fahrenheit, a nodulizing action takes place. The sticky mass rolls into balls, or nodules, but some of it also adheres to the walls of the kiln and is removed by a giant boring bar. Manganese, an alloying element in many metals, is especially important to the steel industry as a hardener, toughener, and deoxidizer. These nodules average about 60% manganese and are one of the highest grade products of their kind. And now, before leaving Anaconda, we'll see what happens to the furnace gases produced in the various operations. All gases come together in a common flue leading to this electrical precipitation plant. Here, all solid material is removed and reclaimed, 
principally arsenic, bismuth, lead, zinc, and copper. Waste gases pass up through the stack. 585 feet tall, this stack towers like a sentinel over the concentrators, smelters, foundries, machine shops, and all the related activities that comprise the Anaconda Reduction Works. From Anaconda, Montana, back through Butte and past the state capital of Helena, the rail distance to Great Falls is 196 miles. Only a few miles from the city, on the north bank of the Missouri River, is located the Great Falls Reduction Works. This plant refines all the copper produced from Butte ores. It also supplies wire bar copper to the company's wire and cable subsidiaries, and cathode copper and other copper shapes to its brass manufacturing plants. And from the zinc plant in Great Falls come not only zinc, but also its associated metals, cadmium, indium, and gallium. Fifteen miles northwest of Great Falls is Ryan Dam, one of 13 similar hydroelectric developments of the Montana Power Company, which supply power to the mines at Butte, the smelter at Anaconda, and the refineries at Great Falls. It's a quarter of a mile long, disgorges 50,000 gallons of water a second, and has a capacity of 60,000 kilowatts. Much of its output is used in this electrolytic refinery, which houses 1,530 lead-lined tanks. Here, the job is to remove most of the remaining impurities from the copper, and to recover the gold and silver values. Inside an electrolytic refining tank, 425 pound anodes are suspended in a solution of copper sulfate and sulfuric acid. Thin starting sheets of pure copper, called cathodes, are lowered into the tank between the anodes. Each tank holds 32 anodes and 33 cathodes alternately spaced. The anodes are connected to the positive side of a direct current circuit, while the cathodes are connected to the negative side. Current flowing through the solution transfers pure copper from the anode to the cathode. In about two weeks time, the seven pound cathodes are built up to 175 pounds in weight, leaving impurities behind as a sludge, which is recovered and treated to reclaim the silver, gold, and other elements. The cathodes are then removed from the electrolytic cell, a tank load at a time. This copper is 99.9 .9 plus percent pure. While some of this high purity copper is shipped direct for use in making brass, bronze, nickel silver, and other copper alloys, the greater part goes to the furnace refinery to be melted and cast into commercial shapes. The cathode copper is charged into these gas-fired furnaces, each with a casting wheel and auxiliary equipment and each capable of treating more than half a million pounds of copper every day. It takes 16 hours to melt the charge, during which time the copper becomes somewhat oxidized, having absorbed some gaseous products of combustion, which must be eliminated before casting. To accomplish this, air is blown through pipes thrust in the molten bath. To further reduce the oxygen content, the temperature of the bath is raised and the charge covered with coke. Forcing green wooden poles below the surface violently agitates the metal and brings it into contact with the carbonaceous cover. The metal now has the most desirable chemical balance for the production of sound castings. A variety of shapes can be cast on the wheel. Among them are wedge cakes and slabs of various weights and dimensions for rolling into sheet and strip or ingots and ingot bars for recasting. Here, 300-pound wire bars are being cast, four to the mold. And taking advantage of copper's high heat conductivity, the molds themselves are copper. Using two ladles, two molds are poured at each spotting of the wheel. After solidifying, 
effects are cooled in a water bath and brought up on a sweep conveyor for inspection, identification painting, and stamping of the furnace charge number into the metal. Normally, over 60% of the electrolytic copper shapes produced at Great Falls is shipped to the company's wire and cable subsidiary for fabrication into electrical conductors. Here, too, in Great Falls is one of the world's largest zinc plants with a rated capacity of 15,000 tons of cathode zinc per month. Zinc concentrates, as received, contain many impurities, most of which must be removed before the zinc can be recovered by leaching. In these multiple hearth roasting furnaces, sulfur is burned out of the zinc concentrates and certain other elements are oxidized. The roasted concentrates are then treated in the leaching plant, from which eventually a purified zinc bearing solution is pumped through the electrolyzing division. This electrolytic zinc refinery is equipped with 1,248 tanks. To supply the large quantities of current required, power from a 110,000 volt line is stepped down in water-cooled transformers to 406 volts to feed these rotary converters, each capable of delivering 10,500 amperes of direct current. In the zinc refinery, the anodes are made of lead and the cathodes of aluminum. Each day, the built-up deposit of zinc is stripped in sheets from both sides of the cathodes. Sent to the casting room, the cathode zinc is melted down and cast into shapes required by the brass making industry or the zinc die casting industry and many others. The principal shape is seen here in the form of 50 pound slabs. Electrolytic zinc is given brand names to indicate its approximate purity. On this slab, the degree of purity is cast right into the metal. 99.99 plus percent. Byproducts in the production of zinc are important too. This cadmium is used extensively as a protective plating on rustable metals. Indium, shown here in cake form, was a chemical curiosity only a few years ago, but is now a full-fledged industrial metal noted for its corrosion resistance and used principally as an alloying agent in bearings. And gallium, a byproduct in the recovery of indium, a relative newcomer to the metallurgical, but priceless in the construction of certain electronic tubes. Great Falls produces the world's largest supply of this rare metal, approximately one pound a month. And that is the story of the mining, smelting, and refining of copper and other metals from the richest hill on earth. From an area of approximately two square miles, it is estimated that more than two billion, five hundred million dollars in mineral wealth have been taken from Butte Hill since Mike Hickey staked his claim to the Anaconda. By volume, the copper ore mined would dwarf the RCA building in New York. And in refined metals, the figures are no less impressive. Copper. 12 billion, 800 million pounds. Zinc, 3 billion, 109 million pounds. Manganese, 944 million pounds. Lead, 460 million pounds. Silver, 541 million ounces. And gold, 2,030,000 ounces. Yes, the richest hill on earth has yielded more copper and more silver than any other district in the world. But Butte Hill does not give up its treasures easily and has demanded in return more than any other district in the world. In development, in organization, in capital investment, 
and in the mining and metallurgical ingenuity which made it possible to wrest 10 pounds of copper from 200 pounds of rock.